Um, hello and welcome to the Eisner Lecture Series with the Center for Cartoon Studies. Uh, my name is Whit Taylor. I'm a cartoonist and faculty member at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Um, and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a quick, quick thank you uh, to the Will and Anne Family Foundation, whose work celebrates Will Eisner's legacy to comics and the next generation of cartoonists, and to the Leslie Center for the Humanities at Dartmouth. Um, I'm really excited to be here today with Roxanne to chat, ask some questions, and we'll be opening up for audience questions uh, towards the end. So just if you have any, just start thinking them up, writing them down. Um, Roxanne Gay is an award-winning and prolific writer, editor, publisher, professor, and social commentator. For our comics fans, she wrote the six-part series, World of Wakanda, published by Marvel. A few of her many critically acclaimed books include Bad Feminist, Difficult Woman, and Hunger. Uh, Roxanne Gay also writes regular opinion column for the New York Times and produces the Audacity newsletter, and is currently working on several television and film projects uh, with more books forthcoming. Um, Roxanne Gay is a renowned um, is renowned across a diverse array of creative mediums, um, and it's such an honor to have her participate in the Eisner uh, lecture series this spring. So let's welcome Roxanne Gay. Thank you so much for that introduction, Wit. It's great to be here. Yeah, how are, how are you doing? It's a little it's complicated, but I'm fine. Okay, <laughs> how are you doing? I, I think. It's, similar. <laughs> um, so let's let's just jump into it. Um, there's there's plenty to ask you about, but um, the first thing I want to say is, is I've been impressed for so long by your versatility as a writer um, and the fact that you cover such a breadth of topics, um, not only essays and opinions and everything from, you know, pop culture, current events, um, novels and short stories, both fictional and autobiographical, um, and more recently comics writing. So like I mentioned, World of Wakanda, um, you did uh, The Sacrifice of Darkness, which was an adaptation of one of your short stories mm -hmm. with Archaea, right? Okay, yes. and then uh, you're currently writing for TKO? I Is am. That... Okay, cool. So um, what made you make the leap from prose writing to comics and what has that process been like for you? I got an invitation to write for Marvel from my friend ta Coates a few years ago and I got an email from him in the middle of the night and I, I, he asked, hey, are you interested in getting into comics? And for Marvel, and I didn't think he meant Marvel Marvel, I thought he meant something else. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And I was excited because I had never even imagined writing comics, but I love trying new things from one project to the next. And I find that working across genres really helps me stay intellectually nimble. So. I said yes, and a few weeks later he emailed me and he said, all right, great, I'm gonna introduce you to my editor, Will, and the email address was something like, it's not actually the address, will at marvel.com. And I was like, wow, I just can't believe Marvel didn't buy marvel.com, what an oversight. But Amazon had done the same thing many years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it was well within the realm of possibility. So I thought, let me see like what this Marvel is all about if they are so audacious as to have marvel.com. And that's when I realized, oh, like Marvel, Marvel. And it was just really overwhelming, but also exciting, especially to write into a canon mm -hmm. and to have to familiarize yourself with that canon because I, the only comics I had really read prior to that were uh, Archie comics, which I love and yes. always have, but that was the extent of my experience. But writing is writing and storytelling is storytelling. And I have found that across genre, the fundamentals are the same. But with writing comics, you think more about scene. Mm -hmm. And you also think about the marriage of visuals with prose and how to make those two things work together in ways that will tell a complete story. And so it's been, you know, there was it was challenging at first. And it's still challenging because, I mean, I'm only working on my fourth comic project, fourth or fifth. And so, you know, there's a lot yet to learn. Yeah. Um by the way, I'm glad you brought up Archie because I feel like that was one of the formative comics for me. So that's that's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess um, what what's been the difference for you know, like you said, coming into a pre-established pre-established storyline um, where there's already like a whole world versus working on presumably new material. Um, what's been the difference like for write, writing in both of those situations? 
Well, when you're writing into a canon, you have to familiarize yourself with the rules of that world, the characters of that world. And I will say that Marvel gave me a lot of leeway and I had a lot of creative control over my story. Uh, but I also had to understand just canonically what different characters had been through, where they were, what was possible for them and what wasn't. And so that was challenging. But at the same time, you also had that as an asset. Like there were rails and they sort of keep you in the right lane. When you write an original, it's challenging because anything is possible. You have to build the entire world. Right. And I find that to be incredibly fun. I love world building, but it's also daunting to think I have to develop every aspect of this character and her world and, and make it make sense in, in ways that are going to be re rewarding for the reader. So they're both blessings, but in different ways. And there are also lots of challenges with both approaches. Yeah, no, I can see that. Um, and with like your, with your book, um, the adaptation, um, mm -hmm. Sacrifice of Darkness, what role did you play in the adaptation of it? Because I know you had another writer on, is that correct? Yes, I co-wrote it with my best friend, Tracy. And uh, so we just co-wrote it and she did a first pass based on my short story. And then I went in and did a second pass. And then we did the third pass together. And then mm -hmm. we sent it off to um, Boom. And mm -hmm. then we sort of, well, we didn't, yeah, we worked with the um, artist who we deferred to on pretty much everything, but we, it was great to be able to see pages and give feedback as well. And also just to be surprised, which is one of the beauties of writing comics. When you hand over the script, you never know what's coming back. I mean, you have, you, you have a sense, but for the most part, it's gonna be pretty different or, unique and I loved some of the interpretations that Rebecca made and yeah. it was just awesome. It's a really beautiful book and I I like uh, from what I hear your philosophy towards working with artists where you realize that they're also uh, storytellers in the process and giving them Absolutely. you know the um, the freedom to to do what they need to do. Yes. Um, has, has writing comics changed like the comics that you read? Um, do you like to read comics now and if so what types of things are you drawn to? <laughs> I don't love reading comics, but for the silliest reason, I do read comics now. Uh, I read, um, I love Saga. I'll yeah. read that forever. I love Monstrous. Mm -hmm. I love Sex Criminals. Um, yeah. There's some really fucking great comics being made right now. I find it hard to read the tiny, tiny print. Yeah. It's just, like you can tell that it's for young people because like they're not thinking about 40 year olds, I assure you. And, and so I do read, fortunately the internet has, or technology really has made a lot possible. And so I read a lot of comics via Comixology and the DC app and the um, Marvel app so that I can make the yeah. window bigger. I was actually just iPad. gonna ask you about that. I was like, there's, there's yeah. other other ways yeah. to do it. That's that's yes. cool. I use um, the iPad a lot. And I must say the new iPads render the comics. It's actually a really beautiful reading experience on the iPad. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. Um, I could talk more comics, but like, like I said, you've done so many things. So I wanna uh, jump into another aspect of your work, um, which is editing. Um, so you have your blog, The Audacity, um, mm -hmm. which is really cool. And I noticed you have comics on there as well. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of work from um, new up and coming writers from various backgrounds. Um, what has been your approach to editing uh, for your blog and like, what do you think, this is kind of two questions, but what do you think makes a good editor? Cause I know you've probably, you've likely been on both sides of the, of the process, so. I have been on both sides. You know, what I like to be as an editor is what I like to work with as a writer. And that is someone who edits the work on its own merits and doesn't try to change a writer's voice but instead tries to help a writer use their, vo their voice and their intellectual curiosity in the most effective way as possible. Yeah. And so um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes I have a heavy hand, but I also tell the writer, and I do mean it, 
These are just suggestions. Ultimately, you are the arbiter of what is best for your work and nobody else can replace you and your vision for this piece. And so I, I try to respect authorial vision as much as possible. It's good to hear. <laughs> um, sorry if you hear a sound up there, my, my toddler just woke up. Um, okay. <laughs> um, anywho, um, so how did, yeah, how did your blog come about? Like I, when I was, you know, I've, I've been reading it and I noticed you too, you said you've always been drawn to, to blogging. Um, so what was, yeah, how did it, how did it end up coming about and how's it been so far for you? Do you mean my, my newsletter, The Audacity? Yeah. Yourself? Yeah. 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 Um, Substack approached me uh, a year and a couple months ago and asked if I wanted to create a newsletter. And I used to have a blog and then I had a Tumblr and I missed it. I miss that sense of writing something for an audience that had lower stakes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that was just, a, I think, a more flexible medium than mm. most of the venues into which I write. So uh, I decided I'm going to write for this, certainly with my own work, but I, I don't have enough bandwidth to be the only person putting work into this project. And so I decided to start an emerging writer series. And so every two weeks I publish an essay from a writer who has three or fewer publications. And then I pay them, I think a fairly good amount of money. And I also have a monthly graphic essay from Aubrey Hirsch, who's a great uh, graphic artist, novelist, and she also writes prose. And I do a weekly roundup. I publish essays of my own on there. And it's just sort of a, yeah, it's like an ongoing conversation about the world we live in and my understanding of it. Yeah. And what what draws you to new writers? Like when you're looking for emerging writers, what I'm not saying you necessarily have to know what it is, but what are some things that excite you when you read uh, work from a new creator? Yes. When a writer has just an unforgettable voice where the way they phrase things, the perspectives they have and how they articulate them is just utterly absorbing and I can't put it down. You know, the reality is that a lot of work that comes in through the submission queue is well intended, but not necessarily ready for publication. Sure. And so, you know, fairly quickly that it's not going to work. So when I can actually read a piece all the way through and either want more or want to go back to the beginning and read again, I know that I'm onto something. And subject matter, it, you know, I'm very agnostic in terms of like what I'll read. I'll read anything if it's interesting. And so I don't have a particular yen for what people write about, but I'm more invested in how they do it. And so that's mostly what I look for. That's helpful. Uh, so um, speaking of like you mentioned with your blog that you kind of just try to reflect on what's going on in the world. And I was recently reading, I think it was your last uh, New York Times opinion piece on, on the slap situation. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure people are, you know, <laughs> tired of talking about it, but I, I really liked your, your piece because I thought that it was, um, I like that you mentioned that it was kind of a Rorschach test of how people's values, their upbringings, um, a variety of things. I thought it was really nuanced. Um, and I think that often, you know, in social media discourse, things get really flattened um, and can be very black and white. Um, and I was wondering, like, how do you, first of all, how was the response to that piece? And second of all, how do you navigate that when writing opinion pieces? Uh, the, new, the response has been mixed, as it always is. Though I will say I've gotten quite a lot of really encouraging and positive feedback and people who have engaged with it in good faith, whether they agree with what I argued or not. And then of course there's the trolling and the people who are sure. like, you're repugnant, I'm canceling my New York Times subscription, blah, 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 blah. And so, um, you know, that part can be hard. I don't care if people don't like my work really, but at the same time, how they go about letting me know can be very challenging. Sure. I mean, people put a lot of effort into it and a lot of cruelty. And so that part's not great. I always just cringe before I ever send anything to my editor at the Times. And it shouldn't be that way. You know, you shouldn't be afraid to do your job. But here we are. 
And, you know, when you write about something, you know, I can't believe that five days later, we're still talking about this. But I suspect it's because we are emerging from two years. Well, not really. We're not emerging. We're still in the middle of two years of pandemic and probably looking at a third. And there's a war in Ukraine. And I suspect that people are really desperate for something that's a little more low stakes. Yeah. And celebrity gossip provides that. It's the same reason why I've been utterly, utterly delighted by the relationship between um, Meg Fo- Megan Fox and uh, Machine Gun Kelly. Like, yes, a weird celebrity couple back, you like drinking each other's blood, doing <laughs> ayahuasca. This is what I need. <laughs> no, I, I um, totally get that. Yeah. And so I think that's why people are still talking about this. But it was also, you know, like I said in my essay, it's a Rorschach test. It was like a lot of people have made it sort of about their own traumas, which I mean, I get in yeah. a way. I don't, part of me, part of me doesn't get it, but the most empathetic part of me does understand like who am I to judge what triggers someone else? That's not my place. And a lot of people are indifferent and a lot of people are like, you know what? Run up, get done up. So. Yeah. Um, you know, just talking about, uh, yeah, the, the moment that we're in right now. And I think that, um, like you said, like years of the pandemic coming out of the, the Trump era, which may or may not be over. Um, but uh, there's a lot of like national drama right now. Um, and there has been this like sentiment that I've seen here and there where some folks have been like, well, the best art will come out of times like this at times of times of um, adversity. Um, but I think that a lot of us like creators are in survival mode right now, um, whether it's due to like, you know, logistical things, mental health, physical health, health, whatever. And there's often this gap between expectation of what we should be making and the reality of what we're able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So what do you do during times that are particularly stressful and disorienting? Like, how do you, how do you exist as a writer? And what would you, if you have any, what advice would you offer to people who are currently um, struggling to make work? Yeah, I try to do the best that I can. I try to be gentle with myself and recognize that there's only one of me and I only have so much capacity. And also sometimes you have a lot going on personally. And in addition to what's going on in the world and in addition to your professional life. And so I just try to balance it all because I'm a Libra. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, my best advice for writers is to have reasonable expectations of yourself. And that doesn't mean don't be ambitious and don't work hard and don't strive for things. It means that if you're feeling stressed, if you're overwhelmed, if you're worried, um, if you have to take a break, take that break. Sometimes when the words don't come, that's your mind telling you, you need some rest. And I think for most of us, it's hard to like turn away and decide, okay, I'm going to just take a break instead of trying to muscle my way through it. But sometimes we can't muscle our way through it and that's okay. And I know a lot of writers were extremely hard on themselves if they didn't like write two novels during the sort of period of self-isolation. And like some people did do that and like kudos to them, truly. (laughs) But some of us didn't and that's okay too. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like you said, I, I think that I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought up the getting rest because I think especially too for a lot of younger creators, there's this idea that you should just keep going and producing and producing. And if you're not producing, then you're not a creator. And I, I don't mm-hmm. think that's a, a healthy or sustainable uh, mentality to have. So um, no, not at all. I mean, look at Thomas Pynchon. He's published not that much, but what he's published is incredibly important. And so you know, quality and quantity are, are not synonymous. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of younger writers feel like they have to, and I've been on that treadmill of produce, produce, produce. Uh, but if you're not enjoying yourself, like, what are you doing it for? Other than, of course, money, but I, I recommend having a job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think- I, the only reason I made it as a writer is because I had a day job. Yeah, I think that's that's valuable advice that's worth repeating over and over um, because I think it's a unrealistic I it's unrealistic to think that most uh, creators at this point are able to 
uh, have an independent living, especially immediately from from doing work. So um, that yes. also allows you that creative freedom when you're not necessarily um, tied into specific jobs that may or may not reflect what you actually want to do. So yes, you know. Um, so another current uh, issue about uh, book banning, uh, which is not a new thing, but it's it's certainly been escalating recently. And so um, seeing a lot of attacks on libraries and librarians, educators um, and writers, particularly from marginalized identities, um, we're seeing it a lot in with you know graphic novels, um, picture books, prose mm-hmm. books, everything. Um, what what is your take on it? Where do you think this is heading? Right now. Uh, I don't think it's heading anywhere good. I think that we're seeing a lot of retraction from the progress that has been made in recent years. And I don't think it's going to last at all because more of this country is progressive than not, though to varying degrees. But right now we do see Republicans are, are, are lost and they are power hungry. And I don't think Democrats are any different, but the Republicans understand that they don't have the majority and they don't care. They're not interested in doing anything that's popular. They're not really, you know, they're interested in doing what they want to do. And they're also willing to do so by any means necessary. And so we see a lot of that, especially in the places where they know that their unpopular policies can take hold. And it's really frustrating to see. It's really frustrating. And it's easy for me to say that because I live in Los Angeles, New York. And so no matter what, at this point in my life, barring an asteroid landing on either of these cities, that's not gonna change. And having lived most of my life in small towns and rural places, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. I understand that it's much harder in those places where the books are actually being banned. And of course, book banning is happening on the coasts as well. So it's just frustrating. I think we have to talk about it. I think we have to resist it at every opportunity because what starts, you know, what they're really doing with book banning is trying to alter history and trying to deny history because they uh, don't want to acknowledge that some really horrific things have happened. And uh, we're not over them because we haven't begun to reconcile them. You know, you can look at a country like Germany, which is a flawed country, but they have continued and continue, you know, since the end of World War II, to acknowledge the Holocaust, to actively acknowledge the Holocaust, even if there's quite a lot of cultural shame around it, which there fucking should be. Um, So until we do that, where the acknowledgement is sustained for a generation or more, uh, we're nowhere. And it's, uh, especially as a writer, to see books being banned is just, enrages me yeah um it's it's accelerating and it's disturbing and um you know like you said even in the u.s where education and what we learn is so dependent on states and localities uh we can get completely different understandings of history depending on you know where we grow up so um no i appreciate you like a whole generation of children that are going to grow up not knowing that slavery was terrible and a yeah. uh, human stain and that the Holocaust also was a human stain. And that's like, how are these children going to function in college? I just don't know. Yeah. So uh, I, I wish that uh, I had an answer or understanding of what's gonna happen, but I appreciate you weighing in on that. Um, I wanted to talk a, lot, a little bit about um, trauma writing, uh, tra- like writing about trauma, writing about identity. Um, and just something that I've heard like, from other, especially from other creators of color um, who are in the process of, you know, pitching, uh, you know, graphic novels, books, things like that. 
is this feeling that they don't have as much latitude in what they pitch compared to their white peers mm -hmm. um, in terms of what publishers are interested in that they tend to be more interested in either in like historical narratives or things that reflect upon you know either racial trauma uh, gender trauma things like that and i'm wondering if that's something that you've encountered and if so um why do you think it's why do you think this is happening it's definitely something I've encountered more so earlier in my career, but gatekeepers often have a very limited Im imagination for what marginalized, or I, I hate the word marginalized, yeah. underrepresented writers sure. can accomplish and what they can know about and what they can be interested in. And, you know, it's frustrating. Again, there's that word, but it is what, you know, like it's, one of the better words to describe like what that people think that you can only write about who you are or your experiences or that you can only write about trauma and that you don't have other intellectual interests while then also saying like why can't I write a character a story about black characters like first sure. of all you can do you but you know like they the, the freedoms that a lot of gatekeepers want for themselves they don't want to extend to underrepresented writers and so I do think it's important to resist that. And that's why from one project to the next, you don't know what I'm gonna do. It's gonna be different and uh, hopefully it's gonna be good. And I'm at fortunately a stage in my career where I pretty much get to write about whatever interests me. And that's great. And certainly with my emerging writer series, I try to extend writers that same freedom. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um... So how is like how has the publishing industry changed since you you know um, became a debut author? Um, what are some some general um, yeah changes that you've noticed? You know it hasn't really changed that much. It's been eight years. Well, I published my first book in two thousand eleven, but it was with a micro press. Um, mm -hmm. Bad Feminist and Untamed State came out in two thousand fourteen, so it's been eight years. And we certainly are having more conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And that's great, mm -hmm. but they remain conversations and the initiatives to address these problems remain things like fellowships, everything that's temporary. And so until the industry stops devising strategic plans and convening councils and things like that, you know, I don't know that we're really going to make any progress because we already know what the problem is and we know how to solve it, which is to say, hire people from a diverse range of backgrounds and intellectual perspectives and pay them. Yes. Pay them well, especially in New York, where the cost of living is extraordinary. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you're able to share, um, you know, what are you currently working on comics wise or anything else? Um, yeah, I, I just love to hear what you're up to. I'm up to a few things. I'm working on some books. Um, the first two are a book of writing advice called How to Be Heard and a young adult novel called The Year I Learned Everything. Hmm. And I am working on some television shows. I'm adapting The Banks, which is one of my comics into a TV hmm. series. And I'm adapting Marco Jefferson's memoir, Negro Land, into a TV series. And I'm writing a couple movies. And for comics, um, my next comic book is called The Ends. And it's about a Black woman who on her 44th birthday discovers that she has incurable lung cancer mm -hmm. and decides to become a vigilante. Not, uh, and she's, a NYPD, um, she's an LAPD uh, de detective. And not only does she go after some of the criminals that got away during her time, both as a prosecutor and then a detective, but also her fellow officers who um, don't value black lives because at the time the story takes place, there's a series of Black Lives Matter protests that are roiling the city because of two cops who murder uh, unarmed black men and uh, one Latino man. And it's about sort of how she comes to justify her vigilantism and what happens to her. That sounds uh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I think it's pretty good, but we'll <laughs> no, see. I'm looking forward to that. Um, how is like, what's the experience been like working or writing for film and television? How has that differed from um, 
other types of writing that you've done? It's much like writing comics in that you think about visuals and you think about the most effective ways to communicate as much story while also holding the reader's interest. And so it's challenging because it just, you know, again, storytelling is storytelling. So most of the fundamentals are the same, but just learning the rules of screenwriting has been, there's, there's a learning curve, but I enjoy it. So, and it, it, in many ways, it is easier to write for the screen than to write entire books. Yeah. Um, is it just more like efficiency of words or what do you, what do you think it is? Well, efficiency of words and then thinking about like what you have to prioritize because with a book, you can pretty much like let the narrative meander however you want. But when you are writing for screen and television, you have a finite amount of space, especially in movies, like generally two hours and that's it. And, you know, sometimes you're going to go over two hours, but you really have to make those extra minutes count. And uh, just figuring out like, how do I develop a good sense of place and a good sense of character and a compelling story and hold someone's interest for an hour, for an hour long drama or for two hours for a movie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you said, that there does seem to be some similarities with comic writing um, in terms of uh, a lot of the limitations for space. Um, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're wrapping up in a few minutes before we get to audience questions, but um, do, do you have any, um, I kind of asked you this before, but any advice for um, young writers who are kind of trying to find their way in the whole writing uh, world at this point? You know, the most important thing I can tell young writers is to write. And I don't mean that in a trite way. A lot of times um, I get a lot of questions about, you know, like, how do I get an agent? How do I do this? How do I do that? And I ask the writer, well, have you written a book? And more often than not, the answer is no. And so people are putting the cart before the horse. I think it's important to educate yourself about the business of writing, but writing, the writing of writing is as important as the business of writing. And frankly, you won't need the business until you've written something. And I also know that you have to be relentless. You have to be willing to tolerate rejection and a lot of it most of the time. And that's okay. Rejection, I don't think it's ennobling, but it does help you, ironically, thicken your skin. And it does sometimes help you learn like what is working and what isn't. Though sometimes you're just being rejected because it's all so subjective. And it is so so subjective. So rejection isn't personal. And uh, that's another thing writers need to remember because sometimes younger writers or emerging writers will get rejected once and just decide, okay, well... I gave it a go. No, you didn't. No, you did not. You're going to get rejected hundreds and hundreds of times if you are um, prolific and that's okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know from personal experience, that is, that's certainly the case. Um, But I think often if you have that drive within you um, and that, I, I don't know, I feel like making comics for me has always been like a drive. Like I just have to I have to get it out, like whatever whatever it is. So um, failure and uh, feedback and all that stuff is part of the uh, the pro- the game, you know. So um, I appreciate that. That's like very practical uh, feedback. So um, I thank you for that. Um, we're gonna jump into some audience questions. So I'll just be uh, giving them to you, and then you can uh, you can answer them. Um, the first question is: Do you find there's a significant uh, there's significant differences between writing prose and writing comics. No, I mean, certainly with prose, there's more words. And with writing comics, I think more in terms of scene and within scene like panel. And so there's, it seems a little more granular when I'm writing comics, that's the Mm -hmm. biggest difference. And also you have to recognize that as the writer, the artist is going to interpret your script, but you have to give them a lot to work with and you can describe pretty much anything you want. Like you can have as much control over the visuals as you want. Now what the artist does with it is a different story, but if you want a character to be ready wearing, you know, like red pants and a blue shirt, 
you know, you get to write that into the script. If there's art on the wall, you get to write that into script. If the street is gritty and dirty and like there's slush on the curb, you know, you get to write that into the script. And so being able to think about what spaces look like and how people are arranged in that space can be a lot of fun as well. And I certainly do more of that in uh, comic writing. Thank you. Um, our next question, advice on how writers and creatives can best juggle day jobs with making art. Do you have any recommendations for what a creative uh, writing BA graduate can pursue as a day job? That's a great question. You know, for me, it's just making the time to write. You know, sometimes you get in a day job and you get caught up in that and you prioritize that. And of course one should because we all have bills to pay. But make the time for writing. Even if you can't write every day, just write consistently. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once every two weeks, but make a consistent appointment with yourself and then honor that appointment the same way you would honor a meeting with anyone else. Because if you don't take yourself seriously as a writer, truly no one else will. And in terms of how to get a job with a BA in English, you can kind of do anything with an English degree or if, was it creative writing? You know, any humanities-based degree is, I, I think of it as a passport because what you really know how to do is think critically. And that's what most jobs require. You can learn the fundamentals of, you know, whatever industry that you want to write, work your way into, uh, but you can't learn how to think critically on the job necessarily. You can improve how you think critically, but you want to have that foundation going in. And so think about like, what do you want to do for eight or nine or <laughs> hours a day and go from there. And yeah, I start with like, what do you want to do? And then what kind of job can you do that is not so absorbing that you don't have any creative energy left at the end of the day? Yes. For yourself. Um, let's see. Is there a common thread in your point of view or a belief that comes through in all of the different forms of writing that you do? A basic belief about reality or what makes things interesting? Uh, yes, I do think that there is a common thread and most of my work, um, you know it's me because the voice is there. So the, one of the most, the primary common thread is my voice. Uh, another common thread is my feminism, which certainly influences my understanding of the world and what I have to say about it. And I think nuance is also a, a characteristic of my work. I agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, next question. Um, I'm interested in a sustained culture of shame in regards to historical atrocity. Despite what you said about how it's lacking in the United States, are there any works you think begin to address it? Or are there any works that address shame in general that you'd recommend? Hmm. I'm terrible at coming up with titles. Nothing is coming to mind, but I'm certain that there are works out there that deal with shame and that deal with acknowledging sort of, not sort of, acknowledging historical atrocities. But yeah, none are coming to mind. And in about an hour, they will. And that won't be any of use of any piece to you. Um, if they yeah. pop up at any time, just feel free. I will let you know. And then you can share it with your community. Sounds good. Um, can you talk more about your relationship with artists on comic projects? Have you ever had the opportunity to pick the artist and how has the collaboration been? Yes, I got to pick the artist for the banks and I picked the artist for uh, Sacrifice of Darkness. And I think they had already picked the artist for World of Wakanda, but I got to see her work and um, I think she's wonderful. So it was wonderful. Yeah, I have no complaints at all. In fact, I have nothing but compliments. Uh, you know, the relationship, especially these days, it's not the same as like for someone who's like embroiled in comics and who like works one on one and intimately with their artists. Like for me, I came into the industry from the outside. And so I certainly, especially with the banks and Sacrifice of Darkness, got to go back and forth with the artists. But really, I believe in letting people do what they do best. And I can't draw. 
I cannot draw a stick figure, let alone anything else. And so far be it for me to try and micromanage the artistic process. It's not my place, but I do love to give feedback. And, you know, the only real feedback I gave for World of Wakanda is that I wanted to see more body diversity among the people in Wakanda. Like not everyone can be thin and muscular and um, have nice bosoms. That's just unrealistic. It's not the world. And they, they listened to a degree. Um, so yeah, <laughs> they listened to a degree. Well, and yeah. I was gonna say, speaking of that, uh, what was your experience like working for Marvel? And at the time, were you already a reader of Black Panther? At the time I was not a reader of Black Panther. And I read up a lot of Black Panther when I got the job. And they sent me basically like the whole of the Black Panther archive, which was cool. And what was the other? Oh, what was it like? Working with Marvel's great. One of the nice things about Marvel, which most people would not find nice, is that you're just a cog in the machine. They are going to churn out a ton of comics every single week. And you just get your script in on time and keep it moving. And it was great to not have everything on my shoulders the way it is with most of my other projects. And obviously I choose that, I love that. I'm a control freak, but with Marvel, um, there was less of that intensity of being the only one. You were working within a system and also the editors there are incredible. They know everything about everything that has anything to do with the projects that they edit. It's just to work with people who are that knowledgeable and that passionate about what they do. I'm sure that there's lots and lots of bad things going on with like the executives and so on, but I only worked ever with my editor and then the publicity people and Will was just outstanding. I would work with him on anything for any reason. Awesome. Um... All right. Can you talk more about the process of adaptation? Have you had to make significant changes to your pre-existing narratives to fit new mediums? Um, wait, what's the, can you repeat the latter part of that question? Yeah, sure. Um, have you had to make significant changes to your pre-existing narratives to fit new mediums? Oh, good question. So adaptation is interesting because it is not a definite, it's not a sort of page to page translation. It can be, but rarely is it that way. And that's why people always prefer either the book or the movie or the book or the, you know, the, the original thing or the adapt, adaptation. You know, different mediums require different kinds of storytelling or different approaches to storytelling. And so in adapting a short story to a, a 130 page graphic novel, we really had to expand. I mean, the short story is probably 30 pages long, but you know, how do you take 30 pages and make it into 130 or more? And so you have to expand every single part of the story. And in many ways that was awesome because I loved the story. And the reason I wanted to write the graphic novel was to um, spend more time in that world. But, you know, I wanted to, and my co-writer, what we wanted to do was make the world as immersive as possible and to make sure that there was enough story to sustain the reader's interest. And when it comes to adapting for film and television, it's really about thinking about the time constraints and the attention economy and how to put as much of the story in as possible. And then also knowing which parts of the story don't need to be on the screen and being willing to let go of certain parts of the story that perhaps are not required on screen. It can be really hard. You have to say goodbye to a lot of your favorite things in the adaptation. Like in, I adapted um, my novel, An Untamed State, into a screenplay and uh, with uh, Gina Prince Bythewood. And one of the characters that I cared for very much is not in the movie. And it's because there was no real place to give her a meaty role and to have something to really do other than just sort of be there. And so that was challenging, but in the end it served the manuscript well, so it's okay. I can always read the novel if I really wanna get in touch with her again. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
Let's see, can you talk about your writing process? Is it something you plan into it or a mix? Uh, it's I mostly into it. And I do a lot of planning in my head and uh, drafting in my head. So by the time I sit down at my computer, I've probably worked through two or three drafts of something. And fortunately I have like the superpower to retain the things that I think about. And in terms of, you know, planning, I'm not really a planner. I teach my students how to plan and outline and organize their work. And for a couple of the projects I'm currently working on, I'm doing a bit of it just to make sure that I can keep track of everything I want to do in the book. But for the most part, I just sort of go on the magic. <laughs> um, just jumping on that question, how do you organize working on multiple projects at the same time? Is it something that you feel like you have a, a natural ability to do or is it something that you've kind of had to learn how to, how to manage? Uh, it's definitely an ongoing process of learning how to manage it. You know, the workload at this point is not great. It's too much. And I just have a hard time saying no. And oftentimes when I do say no, people think it's a bargaining tactic, but it's not. I'm actually saying no because I don't have any more bandwidth for anything. So I drop a lot of balls, unfortunately. I'm not proud of it. I miss a lot of deadlines. And, you know, fortunately, what I eventually turn in is good enough to merit the delay. And I also have a staff of two who work for me full time. And uh, one is a project manager, Meg, and she does research along. With, I also have a part-time research assistant and they give me things to read basically. And I ask them more questions and they go find me more things to read. And then she does all my social media. <laughs> it is not me writing all those tweets. And then, um, I mean, you'll know, you, you know which tweets are mine. <laughs> and um uh, I have an executive assistant who manages my life, basically handles all my scheduling, my calendaring, travel, house management. And I'm very lucky that I can afford to pay them both an equitable rage and health insurance and retirement. And so it's just with help. You know, a lot of people don't want to admit how much help they have behind the scenes, but I am free to write as much as I do because I don't have to do a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks that many people do have to do. And I also don't have children. Uh, that changes things. <laughs> um, I appreciate your transparency on that. Um, okay, so question, it's, uh, they ask, I'd love to hear more about uh, how to interact with bad faith criticism. How have you learned to separate things said in good faith versus bad faith and how do you keep your head above it? Oh, I don't necessarily keep my head above it. <laughs> Uh, it was only through marriage. <laughs> My wife is on the internet, but she's not really online. And so I found myself explaining things that would happen on the internet to her. And she would look at me like I was speaking a different language. And I, I came to realize, oh, wow, I sound unwell. <laughs> and so I've been trying to step back from engaging with bad faith criticism to varying degrees of success. Sometimes I do it and I just recognize, why am I arguing with like Mike 9857321? Like he doesn't really care and why do I? And other times, you know, I don't rise above it and I do engage because it's just infuriating that people will willfully misread my work or misrepresent my work. And I have a very low tolerance for that. And, and I'm not proud of that either, <laughs> but I'm working on it. And I know that something's in bad faith when it's clear that either they only read the headline or they only they read my work with an agenda and didn't like really understand what I read wrote like and it's really obvious you can absolutely tell when those things happen and also when they insult my appearance when they insult my sexuality when they insult my race my gender whatever it's just, you know, you know, and, you know, it's pretty great that idiots are so proud of it and make themselves known with such, a, you know, transparency, uh, to borrow a word from you, Wit. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, some days are easier to get past that than others. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so last question, what is uh, something or some things that are bringing you joy right now? That's a great question. Joy is so important. Um, one of the things that is bringing me joy 
is this little guy. Oh, he's so cranky. So cute. What's See, his when name? When we try to kiss him, he growls. <laughs> <laughs> I love so growl. Fun. This is Max, a tiny growl. He weighs 7.75 pounds. He's not going to do anything. And so Max brings me a lot of joy. Uh, I've been reading a lot of really good books lately. Right now I'm reading a memoir called The Crane Wife by C.J. Mm. Hauser, and it comes out in July. Uh, most of my work brings me a great deal of joy. My family, my niece is around. And she's 10 and she treats every surface like a piece of gymnastics equipment. So like all day, she, you just hear a thud and it's because she's like fucking flipping herself off the couch. It's incredible. Like, first of all, I can't even imagine that kind of energy, but to have that kind of like solid bone structure, good for you. And so like just hanging out with her and she never stops asking questions. So I'm literally keeping um, a browser window open to Wikipedia because every day it's like a hundred thousand questions. And it's like, girl, wow. she wakes up talking, wakes up talking and it's just like do you breathe come on inhale okay something so. uh beautiful about that youthful um inquisitiveness and, yeah it's uh, great you know right? actually i love kids i love 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 kids and so i don't mind it at all and of course it's easy to not mind it when you don't have to live with it 24 7 <laughs> but in general i i find children to be hilarious and i always have so yeah you know, I think it's a lot of fun and it's great to be around someone who is not yet embittered by the world. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much. And by the way, your, uh, your sofa throw or whatever that is, is bringing me joy. Too, oh, so. I, you know what? I always said it's here. Like one time I was on PBS and they were like, can you change your couch? And I was like, what are you talking about? This couch is nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My wife loves typography. She's a designer. Yeah. And so we have a lot of typographical like art and pillows and whatever around the house. Like everywhere you look are like little words. And so that's this blanket. It says, don't fuck it up. It's also a, a good reminder. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, you. Yeah. So it's really nice to talk with you, Roxanne, to hear uh, about you know, your experiences and your different insights on things. So um, that's the all the time that we have for today. Um, before we wrap up, like, again, I'd like to thank Roxanne for your time. Um, thank you to the Leslie Center for Humanities and the Will and Ann Family Foundation for their ongoing support. And everyone have a nice rest of your day and hopefully a lovely weekend as well. Um, take care, everyone.